Greetings to the Barbarian Horde. Welcome back. And if you're new to this channel, welcome aboard. Today we'll be starting a new series. I'm going to tell you a story of astonishing, epic, phenomenal, Jumanjic proportions. I may have oversold that just a little bit. Just a skosh. Like all good stories, this one starts in a tavern. The tavern, like the story, is called the Wailing Willow. And why, you may ask, is it called the Wailing Willow? That's part of the mystery. My name is Brian, and I am the Savvy Barbarian. Written and read by Brian Carey. Chapter 1 The story you're about to hear is completely true. Only the names, locales, times, and events have been changed in order to protect the innocent. Our tale begins long before recorded history, long before the race of men prevailed alone. At a time when fearsome sorcerers battled vampire lords, the rage of dragons shook the foundations of the world and wizards shouted, you shall not perish! To passing lava monsters, the powers of good and evil clashed, and through that strife, portentous legends were born. Death by dragon was imminent. Though the hero was mighty, his savage sword strikes merely ricocheted against the massive dragon's scales, leaving little more than blemishes. His sword was assuredly pointless. That is not to say that the hero's sword had no point at the end. Rather, that is to say that the pointy ends of weapons simply had little effect against a dragon that could swallow a man whole. Consequently, our hero came to the irksome realization that dragon slaying requires more strategy and finesse than merely hook it with the pointy end. The hero of the realm wondered if he could simply feed the dragon an exploding cow. How did the hero find himself facing a dragon in the first place? And where could he acquire an emergency exploding cow? Like all epic legends of high adventure and daring do, where death awaits around every dark corner and within every unlit cellar, this tale begins in but a humble, snow-covered tavern. Unlike dragons, most taverns are typically hospitable and welcoming. In the days of yore, such convivial establishments bespeckled towns, both minuscule and magnificent. People may visit a tavern for a variety of motives, including socialization, job hunting, lodging, and, of course, ill-considered gluttony. Others congregate for business or mischief. Still others arrive to make unwanted and awkward advances to slightly underclad and lusty barmaidens who seem to grow ever more desirable as the night grows short and the tab for ardent spirits grows long. The tavern where our tale begins is quite old and of a somewhat grander variety because it was not only quite capacious, but included upper rooms for rent to weary travelers. Built into the side of a stony crag, it stands at the edge of a city named Mercer, which itself is nestled high in the mountains. And like all good tales, when the fickle finger of fate falls upon the unsuspecting, they are seldom prepared for the perils they encounter, much like the two men approaching. Emerging from the night, two brothers trudged through the snow. At first, they were seduced by the festive music enticing them toward the tavern. They then craved the warmth promised by the flickering orange firelight which streamed out of the tavern's windows and onto the moonlit and snow-covered sod. The first word spoken by our venturing fortune hunters was, of course, bullocks. To be honest, that doesn't make for a very promising start for our heroes. One of them could have uttered some grandiose profundity to be remembered through the ages, such as, It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Or perhaps uttered, To be or not to be. That is the question. 
However, barbarians aren't known for poetry, waxing eloquent, or even kind words, so we are left with a pile of bullocks. If I wasn't right, was I right, Dane, or was I right? Fine. What was that, Dane? The shorter, beefier man provoked. Oh, for the love of Thodane, yes, you are right, Wolfric. You see, Dane, I knew we'd find a town if we just kept going. Yes, Wolfric, you're very smart. Dane patronized, too exhausted to argue. Snow crunched noisily under both men's feet as they approached the building. Each man hauled furs on crudely fashioned sleds made from saplings. The brothers were similarly clad, strictly for convenience and protection from the elements and enemies rather than any sense of fashion. Each brother wore a heavy quilted shirt called a gambeson under a layer of chain mail. Over the chain mail they wore leather vests and various belts and straps which held everything all together. Stiff leather armbands called van braces, which the brothers referred to as bracers, safeguarded their otherwise unprotected forearms, and finally topping everything else was a woolen cloak. Cloaks are best described as a floor-length cape with a hood. Dane, what's the sign say? Wolfric, the older and brawnier of the two, nodded toward the wooden placard swaying over the door. It says, The Wailing Willow, Tavern and Inn. A tavern? I knew it, Wolfric pronounced pretentiously, as if he'd just discovered the lost city of Atlantis. Or penicillin. Really, Wolfric? And what gave it away? The loud music and the bright yellow light pouring out of the windows? Or the overpowering stench of ale in the air? Maybe the horse is tied out front. The point is, Wolfric interrupted, reading your environment is more important than reading your little scribbles, inkling. Really? Dane shook his head. You're really taking a shot at me because I can actually read. You're bragging that you're dumb, Wolfric. Do you not get that? Bullocks, Dane. It's not that you're smart and I'm not. It's that I'm smart in ways that actually matter. The exchange between the brothers was typical. A standard mixture of brotherly love and bitter acrimony. Each would aspire to murder the other if only there was a convenient way to hide the body. Such aspirations were tempered only by enough love to never allow anyone else to torment or harass the other. Tormenting rights were strictly reserved for the brothers. While neither would admit it, at some buried level there was brotherly love, even though they really didn't like each other very much at all sometimes. Although they would never, under any circumstances, actually admit that to anyone, especially to each other. You know what, Wilfric? You're my brother, and I love you, but I really don't like you very much at all sometimes. Suck grapes, you milk drinker. Are you saying you don't want to sleep here tonight? Dane looked up at the cold, bright stars over the mountain ridge. Their shadows cast long in the bright moonlight. The aurora borealis gently pulsated with blues and greens and purples. Dane exhaled. <sighs> Wilfric, I'm tired. You've walked a long way, dragging these heavy bearskins. So yes, it's either here, or we sleep under the stars again, which I really don't want to do. Correct. We are not sleeping under the stars tonight, little brother. Tonight, we drink. Wolfric, we've been walking for days. I don't want to drink. Can't we just get a room? Don't you worry, Dane. You'll end up in a room all right. Just maybe not the same one as me. And he gave Dane an exaggerated wink. Oh, drag. Dane cursed under his breath. Now the word drek has fallen out of common use in recent times, though precedently it was defined as some sort of unwanted refuse. The word was often used as an exclamatory before some abysmal or pending event, such as, Drek, I've left my wallet at home, or, Oh, Drek, I'm about to fall into this fifty-foot-wide hole and plummet to my own horrible death. Regardless, such profanity should not be used in polite company. On the other hand, since they were barbarians with the table manners of a drunken boarhound, perhaps one could be persuaded to overlook such crude manners of self-expression. Oh, Drek. Wilfric, wait. Do just one thing for me, okay? Do not attempt to beguile the serving wenches. You're terrible at it. Are you hearing me? At least don't... You remember what happened in Glimmerdale? Beaten up, thrown out on our barcasses, lost all our goods? You know what? Dane conceded. I've changed my mind. I think we should sleep under the stars tonight. Wolfric, the older of the two brothers, had several abilities that set him apart from his taller, younger brother. One attribute was his greater strength. He was heavily muscled, and he was accustomed to things moving out of the way when he pushed them. Another attribute was his ability to fight hard and hunt well. 
With his thick blonde hair pulled back, sword in hand and foe in view, Wolfric carved an heroic figure. Though Wolfric's most self-treasured ability was his firm belief in himself. Some might call such a belief confidence, or even overconfidence. Severe arrogance bordering on delusional is often bandied about. Wolfric stopped listening to anyone once he'd made up his mind. Dane had theorized that Wolfric possessed some sort of internal listening switch that could be toggled on and off as easily as a wagon brake, or common sense during a political debate. Wolfric engaged his incomparable power to ignore all voices but his own, dropped his sled of bear furs where he stood, and strutted straight away through the Wailing Willow Tavern's entrance. His desire for sampling the local brew and testing his luck with any savory wenches he might encounter far outweighed any unnecessary social protocols such as logic or reason or engaging in acceptable public behavior. Dane followed close on Wolfric's heels, vainly hoping to keep his brother, the future dragon slayer, from imminent foolishness. And more importantly, they needed to keep him from spending all of their money. Wait, what? The chapter's over already? You've got to be kidding me. It was just starting to get interesting. Don't worry. Look over here for chapter two. Don't forget to leave your love and hate in the trumpery below. Let me know what you think will happen next. Here's a hint. You'll be wrong. Also, if you could do me a solid, please click the like, the subscribe, and the bell icon so you'll be notified when the next chapter is out so you won't miss what happens next. Chapter 2.